All right, Friday night, and we're we're chatting already about. Friday, we're talking triathlon. <laughs> we already to get on the air. We just had a a pre meeting uh, podcast that we probably could have turned into a podcast on uh, our record, and and uh, I've got Indian Wells coming up, and just looking at uh, estimated time split based upon power and the course and all that is super interesting. So we'll have to come back and do that. But then we were talking about some toys you got. Yeah, so uh, I, I actually posted it in the Facebook page for the, the Tri Club that I was looking for a good treadmill that would go 12 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were some snarky comments like, you know, you can't run 12 miles an hour. I'm like, maybe I can for a short amount of time. And uh, lo and behold, I go into offer up last Friday and um, find a brand new treadmill for 220 bucks. Perfect. And it's it goes 12 miles an hour, three and a half three and a half uh was a horsepower engine motor uh, i don't know yeah i'm not sure yeah i think that's and um i actually haven't ran on it yet mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's set up um but uh because i'm going to do this with duathlon and i needed a i wanted to do a treadmill this time so running outdoors and then i just got the zwift run sensor mm -hmm. um run yeah that's yep. uh it actually goes on the bed of your treadmill so there's yep. a sensor here and you put strips down on your treadmill at okay. 18 inches apart and then it transmits to your whatever you're zwifting with cool. your bluetooth and uh, tells the treadmill speed so yep. the best part is this is if i get tired during a zwift race i can just get off and let this thing go and i'm just going to go to 12 there miles an hour on my treadmill what's well, it said, nobody said i could I, they said i can't run at 12 miles an hour my treadmill can go that fast and right. just get off and let it go ah. there you go well, i love that device okay so hold that device up because this this brings me back to my uh even my phd work in that i was doing oh. running on the treadmill work and i needed to make sure that the speed was correct Right. Not only when it was running on its own, but also when someone was running on it. So what I did is I actually uh, glued a magnet to the treadmill uh, belt, and yep. then I, I built a, a magnetic switch that would send a square wave to the computer. And so then I knew, you know, how long the belt was, and I could see when the square wave came mm -hmm. on. And then I could get the speed at any time. That's I. No, this see, is exactly I, what this is. I, I know. I should, you could have. You, I gotta check. You know, Rift running was going to be a thing. <laughs> I gotta go. I should have filed a patent on that. Yeah, where's your patent on this? I gotta. I gotta look at this thing. Maybe the, in the, in the, somewhere uh, we, we're sending John Mercer. Uh, <laughs> I want get sold. Oh my goodness! That's back when I was working with accelerometers too, and I actually proposed. A, uh, I wrote a, a grant on a, um, I think I called it a, a wet, a water exercise testing device because I wanted to do it for you know, some of the water work I was doing where you put an accelerometer on the person. This was pre, you know, um, Fitbit. Uh, you put a per an accelerometer on a person and you'd be able to monitor their their uh, fitness. And I, so. You, and you didn't get the grant and then it never happened. <laughs> I did not get the grant. You're exactly if, right. If you would have got the grant, then they would have been called the Mercer bits. <laughs> oh, how funny. Hey, on your treadmill, yep. said you bought it used. <clears throat> what you want to make sure, and you've probably already done this, is make sure the belt is uh, that how it's cleaned underneath. And if it's got the right uh, sort of, I don't know what the treadmill uses now, but we used to use wax to put under it, so. Yeah, I guess there's a silicone spray. Yeah, okay. And, uh, I haven't done that yet, but I'm, I, obviously that's on my list of, of things to do. Um, but yeah, silicone spray. And um, yeah, but it's it's actually pretty amazing. Um, yeah. You know, I, I said it's new, it's it's used new. There mm -hmm. was a, a total of an hour and 36 uh, <laughs> of, of run time. Oh, that's great. I and, went to the guy's house and and, and he had it all set up and it was like the lights were on and everything. I didn't even want to run on it. I'm like, because yeah. I could look at it and I'm like, this sucker is so brand new. Here's like, my money. <laughs> Here's your money. Done. <laughs> well, okay. So you mentioned the, the horsepower of the, of the treadmill. Yeah. That, for people who are looking for treadmills, that is important to look like, especially if you're heavier. Because the uh, power of the treadmill, like I said, I was interested in how the belt, how fast the belt was moving, not only while it was unloaded, but when someone was running on it, because every time you hit that belt, you can slow it down. Yeah, that's why you want to have a good beefy uh, motor on the treadmill. 
especially for the heavier people, because then uh, you don't get that belt speed fluctuation. I, I've had people run on low end treadmills where they were so heavy, they would plant their foot and they would stop the belt. It was, and it would jerk them, right? That's right. That's right. It it's it's actually dangerous. quite dangerous. Yep. That's right. That's right. And then, and, and if you want to run fast, because like part of the reason I got the treadmill was to do intervals, mm -hmm. right? Because it's just so much easier to do intervals. You know, you could set it up and just kind of go. And mm -hmm. um, if you're running fast, you're obviously your ground, your ground, your ground contact, uh, or what is it not? Your ground contact force yep. is higher on every step, right? Mm -hmm. and so, same thing as like if you're under underpowered on your motor, you will have that uh, a little deceleration. Which, yeah, believe it or not, even in in the world of sports medicine, is a cause of injuries. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, you know, we look at people running on treadmills, especially underpowered ones, and they get yeah. weird hip pathology. Yeah. yeah, and you don't even notice it a lot of times, especially if it's your own treadmill and you're running on it all the time. Mm -hmm. you, your body actually starts to get used to this little kind of jerking motion. Mm -hmm. and um and you know i've actually read some research on it where you do that and then you go and run outside like you go and run a race mm -hmm. and you get injured and they think oh it's because i ran the race mm -hmm. well yes because it's just so different than your treadmill experience yeah. Yeah. That's great. it's really interesting stuff yeah and and treadmill running boy we should probably do a podcast on this i mean we've looked at this a lot treadmill running you, like you said you do run differently on the treadmill than over ground but for a lot of what we do using treadmill is actually a good replica replication of, of running so we can answer some questions because a lot of times you need to have those continuous steps to actually analyze. But at the end of the day, there are several differences. And if I'm you know training for a race, you can do some treadmill running, but not all treadmill running uh, yep. because you just run differently enough that it's going to be, you know, you, you could, like you said, put yourself at risk when you start changing to uh, running over ground. Yep, exactly. Well, John, so the topic of the night is a little bit kind, kind of different than this. And, and I, now I kind of feel bad that I proposed it because I, I kind of forgot that you still had Indian Wells because we're starting <laughs> to talk about the off season, but I mean, for many people, we're coming into the off season. Yeah. Like we're, we're mid November here. It's, it's, uh, you know, we're on the, on the, there's not many races left. Yeah, that's right. And um, so, you know, I wanted to talk about, you know, the different types of structured training or not structured training, even uh, during the off season mm -hmm. and how we prepare ourselves for the next season. And I know we talked a little bit about this last year mm -hmm. um, and it's always a good topic because, you know, my, my thoughts on it continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> That being said, I'm going to start out with, with something that we always say, and this is off of the, the research that we, 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 were, we went through this week. Number one thing is consistency. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and if you don't have the consistency in your training, and it, and it doesn't have to be consistently high volume, mm -hmm. especially <clears throat> in the off season, yeah. but you got to still do something. Yeah. So what are your, what are your kind of take home thoughts, not even take home thoughts, initial thoughts, I guess, on the off season? Like, how do you, how do you approach an off season? So I love it. Now I got to just give a shout out to Matt. He did post on our, uh, when we were talking about treadmill, he did say deck length is important for tall people for of the treadmill. And that's a good point that you do need to look short at. Guy, short guys like me doesn't really matter, but he's absolutely <laughs> right. But what's interesting is even if we look at how long of a deck you, you, you know, you think you need a, a lot of times it's probably two thirds. It, it's not even, you don't need all that treadmill. My hands are almost always hitting the, hitting the thing because of fear in the back of your mind to fall. That's, that. that's right. That's right. It's the feeling that you have that you're at the edge. And so it's a, it's a funny thing. All right. So yeah, you, you know, you saw the words are already and, and I'm a hundred percent behind the idea of just being consistent. And, you know, coming into off season, you know, consistent can be consistent something. It doesn't need to be consistent the same as what you've been doing for the last, you know, two or three months where, where people are prepping for some of the longer races. And so, you know, this is where you add in the hiking, you add in the kayak and you add in some consistent physical activity and then you exit the off season ready to, uh, to, to go in terms of one of the tenants uh, just consistency of, of anything uh, is good. Yeah. 
it's amazing when you look at the research of how you can mitigate fitness loss mm -hmm. yep. by doing very little. Yep. Right. But you got to do something. Mm -hmm. The worst thing we can do in the off season. And actually let's, let's, before we can go with that. Yeah. The worst thing you can do in the off season is do nothing. Well, but let's kind right. of define the, let's, let's kind of define the off season, right? Mm -hmm. Because for me in general, it's three weeks. Okay. Like then I go to a kind of a transition time mm -hmm. where I'm actually starting some structure. Um, but like three weeks of just like, Hey, let's not think about triathlon. If I want to go for a bike ride, because it's a nice day mm -hmm. outside, I go for a bike ride. If yep. I want to go to the pool, I go, if I don't, I yep. don't. Yep. Um, like right now I'm kind of in the middle of that. I, I ran twice this week, 5k each time. That was plenty. Right. Yep. I don't, I, you know, and, and, and I think that that's important that even, you know, as we, as, as we start to think about this is, is think about what your off season is, mm -hmm. but you need to take some time that is, a, is not, it's a way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that will vary from person to person. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, I see the danger in the, in this time in new triathletes mm -hmm. of being like, cause you know, we, we tend, John, you and I tend to forget, yeah. right? So what does a new triathlete often do? They either do, they forget, like say, Hey, I'll start this again next year. Or they're so excited about it. That's right that, oh, I can't possibly take time off because I'm on this meteoric rise. Mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. that's the problem in the beginning, right? You're like, oh, mm -hmm. here, we started this level. And now, man, I'm, at the end of the season, I'm like, I'm on all cylinders and I'm going to ride this pony and I'm going to keep on going. And I'm, I'm going to sign up for this race and this race. And I'm going to mm -hmm. do all these running races. And I'm going to find a grand fondo down in California to ride. And I'm going to do this and this and this. And they burn out. Yeah. So I think that it's, we, we do have to be relatively, uh, relatively careful with that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I love it. Um, I, I, going back to where you started, I think the phrase is minimum effective dose. Yep. You know, what's the minimum that you can do to maintain your fitness? And what's amazing is that minimum is probably really low. It's a lot lower than people think. It's a lot lower. And so, you know, for example, I'll, I'll go do Indian Wells, but I, right now I do not have the time to really put in a, a, a proper training block before this race. Well, all I'm thinking is minimum effective dose. I just need to get to the start line and then, you know, whatever happens, happens. And, you know, I can just treat it as, you know, at worst case, I'll treat it as a training day. But, but, you know, we carry a lot of fitness already up until this point in the season. If I can just do a minimum effective dose to get to that start line, you know, I'll be comfortable and uh, I'll, I'll go and enjoy the race. And I think that's something to keep in mind in the off season is what's your minimum effective dose. So spend time with the family, you know, and they're in the holidays. Uh, don't feel like you've got to get out, um, you know, on, on a holiday when you've got family um, you know, gathering. That's exactly what you want to do. What are you talking about? <laughs> when my family's you around. You know, it's like, oh, hey, sorry, I got a four-hour bike ride. I'd love to sit around and, and get yelled at and uh, throw stuff at each other. But no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I have a great time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love it. But there are some people that they need the escape, too. Yeah. yeah. Family. Well, and that's healthy. And and I think as athletes, um, I think that, that maintaining that regular physical activity is important for our mental health as well as our, our physical health. And maybe maybe the mental health even – you know, takes precedence at, at this, at this time, you know, I've had a, a bunch of meetings this morning and I'm like, okay, let me, I just got to get out for a bike ride. And I don't usually ride in the afternoon, but look, it was just so nice to go for a ride after being in meetings all morning. And, uh, and that mentally is just a, uh, is a good break. So, you know, that's the triathlon, I, I call it triathlon lifestyle, just, you know, doing, you know, some activity at this point in any of the sports is good. Yeah. Well, and we're so lucky that, you know, because we have that outlet, right? Because I did the same thing today. I got, a, I had a break and at 10 o'clock I went swimming. Yeah. Right. And just zipped out of the pool hour, came back, got on the next meeting. Yeah. And like, I feel so blessed that I can do that. And mm -hmm. then, you know, and, and I felt so much better afterwards. Um, and I'm sure you did after you, you rode. Yeah. Like the mental clarity you get. Oh, totally. Yeah. Well, okay. So you're talking about the length of off season. What, what I do is I look at 
my next race in 20, in this case, 2022, and then I back off 12 weeks. Yep. And then I say, okay, that 12 week period is where I really want to start, you know, ramping things up. Why 12 weeks? Well, you know, that's a little bit of history and, you know, what I feel I need to, to get ready for usually a, at least a 70.3. If it's a full is my next race, then I'll probably do a little bit longer than that. But usually 12 weeks out of that first race is um, is where it really start. So now that sort of defines the off season. So if we're doing Oceanside, what's Oceanside this year, April or next year? Yeah, it's 20 weeks. Oh, there you go. So my off season could be eight weeks minus the three weeks getting to Indian Wells. So that's, I, um, you know, let that the longest I'll be five weeks for off season. Yeah. And, you know, and, but John, I think it does play a role. Like you and I both have a full Ironman in the beginning of May. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's different. Like, cause historically, like I'll do a race like Oceanside. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'll do the same as you like 12, maybe 14 weeks, yeah. but we have to back this up a month later with a full Ironman. Yeah, that's true. It's not like I do that 70.3 and then maybe I'll do another 70.3, six weeks later. Like mm -hmm. I'm continuing to build Yeah, for me now the race is the may race and oceanside is a step that's right that's a good point that, yeah towards that may race this this year right mm -hmm. so i think it's a little bit uh i don't know maybe different this year mm -hmm. but that's you know those are those are my rambling thoughts on it no that's good and and but i think what what you're doing and what we're doing is is you know looking at the calendar and figuring out okay for this period of time three weeks four weeks five whatever it is i need to to sort of back off my regular training and but not lose my fitness yeah. and then start uh start ramping up with a plan and and i think that's uh we we have done an episode on off season so yeah. that, and, 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 and but not maybe the, the you know kind of the same under the same umbrella of mm -hmm. of really starting to to think about the the how we're going to train when we when yeah. we do what we do in the off season so you know, there's two main schools of thought that you come across in the literature. And the one that we've talked about before is periodization. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about periodization. And I know in that episode, we talked about periodization, well, a few, we did mention reverse periodization. Oh. And, you know, I am, uh, I'm now more of a convert to reverse periodization. I did it last year. Mm -hmm. um, it actually worked really well for me. My spring race was, I came out, you know, with, pretty good result and um i guess maybe we should define these yeah. two things i guess that would probably help so the general periodization that most people go into is okay uh you finish your season you get a rest have your rest time then let's go to the off season training mm -hmm. which is base training nothing fast long slow distance build the aerobic system then as the race season starts, so maybe you're looking at 12 weeks out, um, let's now let's add the intensity. And so we'll have, you know, some, you know, basically the intensity goes up, the base, the aerobic stuff goes down. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of the traditional uh, approach, but many triathletes are going towards a reverse periodization. And it, and what that is, is during this off season time, is you work on specific areas that are um, is more intensity and less of that long, slow. Mm -hmm. And you do that long, slow stuff when you're actually in your race season um, instead of the intensity stuff or as much intensity. So for example, for me, um, after my little transition period here, I'm gonna go into some VO2 work, um, very, very focused uh, VO2 work. Then I'll go to um, an FTP building stage. And then as I get closer to the race season, then I'll be actually, I'll, I'll go to race specific training. Mm -hmm. So for the 70.3 and the Ironman, because I got to be honest with you, in the last Ironman build I did, the last six or seven weeks of it, I didn't do much intensity, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. I'm trying to build width, not up. No. And um and I felt, I felt like that was a good way to do it. And we oftentimes we've, we've talked about too, is race specific, specific training. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that, um, I don't know, I, I, there, once again, there's two ways to, to, there's many ways to do this, or you could just roll the dice and train however you want. And, 
you know, you feel like doing this, this day and this, this day um, and, and see what you get. There's the, not a lot of triathletes like that. <laughs> there's a lot of triathletes like that. So I, 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 I characterize triathletes as heavy, as heavy planners. Um, and so but there's a lot of triathletes that go off of feel. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like this today. So that's what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do today. Yeah. Um, the one thing that we came across, so we, we did review a few articles was that structured training plans where there actually was a plan mm -hmm. is more important than if you do periodization or reverse periodization. Mm -hmm. And well, yeah, that, that, that's great. And thank you, Vernice, our content cur curator to finding curator, yep. papers, because I'll tell you, I had not uh, looked into reverse periodization at all. And I know you've mentioned it before, but it was really interesting reading the papers and, uh, and, and, and looking at them. And so, but this conclusion is really important. The structure training would be either the, the linear or the reverse. Yeah. And either of those were better than not having structured training. Yeah. And not having a plan at all. Yeah. Yeah. So take home message. <laughs> we were only halfway through is to actually have a plan. Uh, so, yeah, it's funny. Actually, I, I did some side reading on this then. And uh, this does raise a really interesting uh, uh, thing to talk about. And it's exactly what you just said, is that having a plan is probably better than having no plan at all. Yeah. And I know that sounds odd, but it almost doesn't, in, in the papers that we read, it, it didn't really matter what the plan was. The folks were going to, the, the, the subject were improving. And yeah. so this, this becomes an interesting uh, perspective of training because the issue with, um, with trying to lay out a plan is this year is different than last year. Absolutely. And it's different than the year before. I could do the same three mile run today, but that doesn't mean I have the same stress today as a year ago from now, or even yesterday, or what I'm gonna have tomorrow. There are so many factors that come into play in terms of the stress, and you've been good at about talking about training load, but it, it's environment, it's um it, it's you're 100 right and but the interesting part it's also what our mindset is yep. when we're trying to train and and our mindset may actually play a big role in what the training response uh ends up being no i i couldn't agree more so let's take a, an example of like an a, a vo2 block mm -hmm. so let's say in, in three weeks i'm going to do i don't know nine vo2 sessions mm -hmm. So some running, some swimming, some biking. I also have to go into that knowing that I can pull the plug at any time. Yeah, right. Right. If today's not the day mm -hmm. I wake up or I didn't sleep well and I got to do a VO2 run session, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. right? So there needs to be, there always needs to be flexibility in your training. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that are coached, you need to, to speak with your coach about this is what do I do when it's a hard session and I wake up and I don't feel it? Mm -hmm. Or I've got so much work to do today. I'm, I'm stressed. I cannot do it. You no. get home from work at six o'clock and all you can think of is laying on the couch and, yep. you know, what do you do on those days? You should, you should have a, a backup plan. Mm -hmm. And the backup plan might be to do nothing. Yeah. Right. And this is where those of you that are coached need to have these talks with your coach uh, about those days or about the day where you're like, you feel like you could break through the walls and yeah. you have all the energy in the world and you got, Hey, it, it was a holiday on Thursday. Mm -hmm. I got a, I got an extra day this week. Right. Let's, let's figure this out. And, yeah. um, and so the plan is, a, the plan is a plan, but the plan also needs to be, it needs to be flexible. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you can still, you can have that flexibility and still have an idea of these three weeks this is what I'm focusing on. Right, right. Right. And then the next block, this is what I'm focusing on. Mm -hmm. And, and we're still, you know, talking about a, a, a polarized training model or, or a pyramidal training mm -hmm. model where most of the work is still the long, slow stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just not all long, slow yeah. at this time of year. So, and, and I love this because what, what you're also speaking to is, is this is why it is important to have a coach. You know, even though you and I are, are largely uh, self-coached, the benefit of having a coach is that that plan is laid out. 
And the key I've always said uh, with an athlete is the athlete needs to match up well with the coach because the athlete has to trust that the coach has their best interest uh, at heart and that the plan is for that athlete. Uh, because again, this goes back to the idea that part of your training benefit may actually be your mindset in terms of what you think you're going to get out. This is so hard for me to say as a physiologist and biomechanist, it's really funny. You know, we, we think, no, if you train at this heart rate, you know, which is a percentage of your max heart rate, you should get this type of training response. It's not that easy. You, you, you won't always get the same training response. And sometimes you actually can get a negative training response. But that belief that you're going to get a training response may actually be a really important factor. And then having a coach that you believe in uh, becomes really critical. I remember talking with an athlete a few years ago, and uh, this athlete was was you know questioning what the coach was prescribing. And I'm like, well, why are you paying the coach? And if you're not going to follow what the coach is is giving you, then you've you've lost the benefit of having a coach. That that's why you're you're hiring someone just to help to help you, and and you've got to believe in it. You got to trust them. Yeah, and I think the conversation even with your coach is it's acceptable to not do every workout, right? No. But you should have a minimum that you do, mm -hmm. right? So I, you know, I've been reading in some books that you know, eighty to eighty-five percent of the workouts the coach prescribes should be done. Mm -hmm. That's good compliance. Yeah. A hundred percent is not good compliance, by the way. <laughs> no, it, seriously, yeah. You can run into problems with a hundred percent compliance because then they're just they're they're just so like they're not they're not taking their own feelings mm -hmm. and their own life stresses mm -hmm. into it. And then obviously like you get down to the 70%, 60% compliance. Well, once again, you might as well just be coaching yourself Yeah, right. at, at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it, it is, you know, and, 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 and like you said, you and I both, neither of us uh, have coaches. And, uh, but I think that, that maybe the difference between you and I is, is this is our business. This is, yeah. Like triathlon is not our business, but physiology, biomechanics, athletic training, this is what we do on a daily basis. And so I think we have a little bit different insight. Th that being said, there's been many in a night I've laid awake and said, maybe I should hire a coach. <laughs> yeah, get, it, get it out of my head. Yeah. Um, and I know you've had those same thoughts because we've talked about yeah, it. Yeah, and, and I have I have tried some coaching uh, a little bit this year. And on one hand, it was really helpful to be able to get a plan laid out that was different than what I would normally do. And in that case, I was able to see, <laughs> it sounds terrible, but how could I go from six days of training to seven days of training? And, and that was really good because for me, I could say it ended up being a little easier plan, oddly enough, to try to go seven days a week than, uh, than, than to go six days a week. But my problem was, I was always sitting there saying, okay, this is what the pro coach prescribes. Now, now, how do I fit in my workouts? <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't necessarily very compliant. <laughs> and that's a problem too with compliance, right? When the athlete does too much. Yeah. Because a lot of times I think the coach's job, especially in the off season, mm -hmm. is to pull you back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? And um, it, it is a really interesting relationship. And and, and, and I would say it's another interesting thing is I think a lot of people don't, they don't hire coaches in the off season. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They hire them about four yeah. or five weeks away from their first race. Right. And if you're out there looking for a coach right now, now's the time to be looking for one mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. now's the time where you can actually have a good period where the coach can learn you mm -hmm. and you can learn the coach and yeah. You can you can absolutely make some. I think you can make some great gains in the off season. Mm -hmm. you know, I I kind of look at the off season as as a chance to actually make gains. Yeah. Um. Because it honestly, it you know, last year was a weird year of racing. You know, we didn't know if races were going to happen. It kind of like started a little bit late for most people because Oceanside didn't happen, mm -hmm. um, Rage didn't happen. You know, so it was a weird season. Um, but on a normal year, John, I know you, you're kind of like me, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 races. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to actually make gains during a race season like that. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I feel like for me personally, like if I can be really fit and ready to go in May, 
and I kind of can hold mm -hmm. for the rest of the season, I'm doing well. I don't really feel like I make very many gains during the race season. I don't know. How do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a long season. And I think if we, if we don't take that step back, it, it just makes the season, uh, it, you, you really run the risk of, of burning out. And so well, I'm saying take a step back yeah. but then in the off, in the off season, mm -hmm. not, not the rest time. Yeah. Yeah. In the off season, that's the time to build. Yeah, no. I, and, and I think that's the time to take a step back and, you know, I should be doing more strength training during the off season because I don't find the time to work it in regularly. I, I think you're right. I think it's a time to build some aspect of your, uh, of your, repertoire of uh, of training so uh, and sorry i got a little distracted because i wanted to bring up this graph and i want to talk through it because i really liked these well, papers and you've before talked we go, about before we go on to this john oh, i would say yeah. i would contend you did a real you did a ton of strength training last winter you did <laughs> oh well that's funny <laughs> you say that because actually this is about the time when i started re restoring my trailer i know and, you, and like, you were like sometimes i'd call you and you're like sweating I'm like john what are you, are you hitting the weights hard he's like no i just tore down the walls of my trailer i'm like john you're killing yourself well what i what i started doing is going back i i recorded a summary video of each day almost every day and i started going back and watching those and Oh, I can't. It was strength believe. training, and it was definitely flexibility training. Oh, like you were in some weird positions. Oh, and... totally. I, <laughs> I, I don't know how I did it, but it's uh, yeah, it's it's sort of fun thinking about it. I'm gonna try to take it out next week. So, awesome. Uh, and I'm taking it to Indian Wells, so I got a campsite at Indian Wells. So, oh man, that's gonna be its longest journey. It will be. Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> we'll check everything twice on the way. All right, so let me bring up this um, paper and uh, let me bring up the authors, uh, Bradbury and colleagues. This is a 2020 paper, so very, uh, very um, current comparison of a linear reverse linear paradise, paradise programs uh, and they equated volume and intensity for endurance run performance. So this is really a neat paper and uh, I like this figure. And uh, this figure uh, is uh, describing the three programs, the linear, the reverse, and the control group. And you, you've already done a good job of explaining this and that the linear is slowly building the intensity over time and increasing the intensity more at the later stage, whereas the reverse is doing more of the higher intensity stuff early. Is that right? Yep, that's exactly it. And so here's distance. So obviously the distance of the programs end up changing. So this is the linear, uh, the, the, the distance is actually going down because the intensity was going up, whereas the reverse is going in opposite. But the load uh, is high for the reverse and then bringing it down. Whereas the linear, the load is low at, in the beginning and then uh, higher at the end. Yep. And the control is the same. Yep, exactly. And so now if we, go down i'll jump into the discussion here uh let me see where they say uh uh to the to the oh sorry i should have highlighted it um uh, okay so this this is it and they they said this sort of funny consequently the hypothesis that recreational endurance runners in the reverse paradise group would elicit greater improvements in athletic or uh, in uh, anaerobic threshold and running economy after a short period of training, then the linear progressive group and control group was not supported. Right. So they're they're talking science talk and they're saying yeah. that hypothesis is not good and it's not good because the linear and the re and the uh, reverse groups improved the same. Yep. And so it didn't matter which group you were in, you improved the same and they both out mostly and most of the parameters outperformed even the control group. Yeah. But the, in, in, you know, so the, 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 you know, obviously it's a great study. I, 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 I really enjoyed reading it as well, but we're not, they were, they were trying to get to one, one set point in time, mm -hmm. not, not preparing for a season. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's a 5k. That's right. You're right. Yeah. And it's a 5k we're talking about, like I'm talking about getting ready for the Ironman world championships in May. Yeah. Right. Right. Which is a little bit, a little bit different. And then I'm, 
no, then I'm thinking about another world championship, maybe in October and oh. another, you know, 70.3 and this and this and this and this. And so, but, but, but it still goes back to the original thing we said is that a plan is better than no plan. Right. Well, and, and what I like about this study is the other thing that this highlights is something that we don't really think about in that, oh, I, I don't recall the, the training sessions, how long they were. Um, but let's say that you're going to train 30 minutes a day for, you know, a run. That's 2% of the day. Yep. And then if you take it out over a week where maybe you only train, you know, run four days a week, it's such a small percentage of the time. And so sometimes when we do training studies, we, we have to realize that the training intervention is such a small percentage of what's happening in their regular daily lives. And there's other things that can come into play. You could change your diet. You could yep. change your, your habits of when you get up or when you go to bed or you could change your mindset in terms of what you think you're trying to get out of this study, you know, because this is one thing is that, you know, maybe the, the uh, athletes in the in the two groups improved simply because their mindset was, oh, this must be a good training program. I'm on a plan as a, I'm on a plan. And so maybe there's a mindset issue here. And it's not necessarily well, we don't know. But it may not necessarily be that the intervention of the exercise is the key it could be maybe you you improve the amount of recovery that you, that you've done maybe you've maybe you're you're walking more uh because you you've started this training there's so many other factors that come can come into play uh in a training study like this it's hard hard to really account for all of them john what's the phenomenon called and i i don't know if you even know it where when somebody starts to exercise they eat better Oh, I don't, I'm sure there's a name for that. There's a name for it. I can't remember, but it's a thing. Mm -hmm. Like, and this yeah. is a, a known thing is that once someone actually, especially when they reach that 60 day mark where yeah. that becomes habitual, mm -hmm. that they actually start to eat healthier. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I, we're going to, I'm going to have to ask one of our nutrition uh, colleagues uh, the name. Actually, I can probably just look it up. But um, yeah, so where does that enter into this as well? And, 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 it, and does that change based off of you have a plan versus not? No, that's an excellent point. That's exactly what I, I, I think we have to remember when we look, look at these training studies is there may be some, I'll call it a confounding factor, or there may, may actually be some other factor that's causing the training response that's not the intervention itself. Yep. And so even you know when we talk about placebo effect, well, that, you know, placebo, it, it may, sometimes it may be a belief that something's working. Yeah. So, you know, when I had one of my doc students do uh, some work on compression uh, gear during running, and one of the things he was looking at was, do you believe that these compression socks will help you? And if you can tease that out, which is really hard to do, <laughs> but if you can tease out your belief in something, that may actually be one of the key factors to that are, are is causing a, a positive response in in whatever intervention you're looking at. Oh, it's it's so big. It is yeah. like that that is so big. The one other thing I'm going to add, uh, I know we're getting close to the hour here, is and why the other reason I'm moving towards this uh, reverse periodization is if you do the linear periodization, you should be doing long, slow rides in the winter. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and. You know, I have a, I have a limit to how many hours I can spend on my trainer. Yeah. Right. And, or how much weather I'm willing to, yeah. uh, so, you know, place my body under, like if it's cold and windy, mm -hmm. I just have a hard time going five hours outside on the bike. And I definitely have, I, I think my longest trainer ride is four hours. And, and that was just to, to get a badge on Zwift one time. Yeah. And that's a long time. And that's a long that's time. A, how many changes of, of shirts and shorts or <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, it, you, you, it, it, yes, it's uh so I think that that does play into it as well, is the seasonality of, of training. And we have shorter days. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's it is harder to do a six hour ride or five hour ride when you have a shorter day. Yeah. Um, and so I think that there is, you know, if you're gonna, you know, in my mind, if I'm gonna do a plan, that's and I've done that plan, I've done mm -hmm. the the linear approach where I just did a ton of volume, yep. uh, long, slow volume in the winter. And it, it works. 
Like don't worry, I had some I had some good years off of that, but mentally it was hard. Yeah. Every Sunday to go out and do four hours and five hours on the ride on the ride and a long mm-hmm. run on Sunday when it Saturday when it was cold out and mm-hmm. and we're super lucky. I mean, we're living in Las Vegas. We yeah. actually can do this most days. That's true, right? You can train year round. If we're looking at you know where you and I are both from, mm-hmm. you know, in New York, people aren't. Riding on the roads for four or five hours in the winter, and definitely not in Canada, uh, where I'm from. Um, so I think that you know maybe that's why this model is gaining traction. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it it corresponds with some of the the high intensity uh, benefits that that we've seen in the literature, yeah. and uh, you know because the idea is that by doing that that high intensity early on in the program, you're engaging more muscle fibers. And then you're backing off and now you're doing the longer stuff later. And physiologically, that that does make sense. And race specific wise, it does. Mm -hmm. If I'm training to get ready for a race, it's going to be 10 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. This, you know, we all know that we want to, I think we don't all know, but it's a common thing in, in, in the athletic world that we want to become more specific, the closer to the race we come, we, we, we get. Mm Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't consider doing a 10 hour session right now. Right. No. Right. But maybe in April, I would. Mm hmm. Well, maybe not a 10 hour, maybe an eight. <laughs> but yeah. So anyways, you know, do whatever you want as far as, you know, with, with people, what they do or, but I still think just have a plan, have a plan, you know, yep. and, uh, and, 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 but have flexibility with your plan. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right? I think that that is, I think that's really, really important is to have that flexibility. Now, the other thing I'm going to add on the off season, and um, this is something that uh, I heard on a podcast with, from Angela Nath uh, a long time ago, she, you know, pro triathlete, they used to live here and uh, you should gain some weight in the off season, mm-hmm. a really healthy thing to do. Yeah. I know it's hard, you know, but putting on 10% weight is a good thing to do. It will help <laughs> your endocrine system. It'll help your health. And as you're doing some of this work, uh, as you come back, you'll actually have a little bit more resistance, right? You'll stress the system just a little bit more as you're, as you're pulling that weight back off. And I think that that's also an important thing is to allow your body to kind of, I don't want to say go, but actually mm-hmm. gain some weight in the off yeah, season. Right. It's a healthy thing. No, I love that. And, and I, I like the idea still of having some flexibility in your plan. And you know, when you have that plan, I also like to just go and look at dates and I start looking at, you know, when is, you know, a peak time at work or yep. when there's a birthday uh, celebration or, you know, when's a family get together or, you know, and, and check those days off that you uh, have to adjust based on that. So I think that, that, especially in the off season, as we go into the holiday season at the same time. Yeah, yeah. If you're, you're going to go visit family for a week yeah. in, in, in Canada, like, yeah. Like, yeah, I normally do. I'm not going to ride for 10 days or whatever that I'm yeah. there. Right. And maybe we'll get in the pool a couple of times and mm-hmm. maybe I'll put my ski goggles on and go for a run outside once or twice. I love but, that. <laughs> but you know, you, you love doing it because you, because you don't have to live it all. Once in a while. And then, exactly. and then once in a while, go, then leave and leave it behind. Yeah. But have that, you're right. Have that flexibility to, to do that. I think it's important. No. Yep. What are your, what are your kind of takeaways, John, other than that? So, well, I, I'm not going to move off our idea of uh, consistency. Uh, I think that that is good and that um, I think can be your plan as well. Uh, but then I think that the other big takeaway we've said, we've said it several times is have a plan. Yeah. Any plan is probably better than no plan. Yeah, I think that there's also, I, I don't know if you're from, I'm sure you are with needs analysis. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of the, you know, the study of what, what, what needs to be fixed, what needs yeah, to be yeah. worked on. I think it's a good time to do that too, right? Is, huh. is, you know, really look at yourself and say, you know, one of my needs is I need to run faster. Yeah. If that's, if that's your thing, right. You're looking at your results from this year and you're like, oh man, like I'm right there on the run. And then uh, I, people just pass me like crazy on the, or sorry, right down the, getting off the bike onto the run. People are passing me like crazy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, the needs analysis for you might be, I need to run faster. Yeah. Right. Um, and work on work on that. Find something, you know, maybe in the off season that you can actually work on 
Um, and, you know, cause I think oftentimes we work on our strengths, especially in the off season. It's like, Oh yeah, I really enjoy this. So I'm going to keep doing this. And, and um, you know, we also heard the term like low hanging fruit, like what's mm -hmm. something that's kind of low hanging there that you can actually, you can actually do. We often hear about it in swimming. Oh, now's the time to work on your technique. Yeah. I contend it's also the time to work on your run technique, your bike technique, if that's what you need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. And, and I, I'll add one more to this, um, work on your mental thoughts in terms of what you're getting out of your training. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't mean to be rainbows and butterfly, but you've got to look at each training session as you are trying to get something out of it and that you are expecting to get something out of it. And, you know, we had, we know we have bad days, but if you've got three sports, you know, plus whatever else you do, you know, you may be able to look at some improvement in one area and, and sort of a plateau in another area, but really, you know, be being, you know, looking positively at what you're doing, uh, and, and why you're out there training and and don't don't approach oh, i hate running i don't want to run it's going to be painful i'm going to be sore after that that just reinforces a real negative uh perspective of of that activity you really gotta and i i know i've always said this is you know before I, and i did it today because i was dragging a little bit i said okay right before i jump in the pool i'm just gonna say i love it and i jump right in and go and you've got to have that mindset uh, to be able to, you know, be in the sport for a long period of time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right, John. Well, hey, that was great. Thanks again for another awesome Friday night. Yeah. You got any plans for the weekend? Football game tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. Big deal for the my program. It's the 40th anniversary of the athletic program at UNLV. And so we're celebrating that tomorrow at the stadium. It's my first time going to the going inside Allegiant Stadium. Oh, nice. So I'm pretty excited to see the inside of the stadium. And then uh, I'm planning a pretty big bike ride on Sunday if the weather holds. I'm going to do Level Canyon. And uh, I've only ever done that once. And yeah, I figure it's time to, time to go do that one again. Well, that sounds great. And congratulations on the 40 years of athletic training. That's, that's been such an important program. So great to, great to reach, that, reach that milestone. I'll, I'll come by. Yeah, we'll see you there. And then I'll, I'll go to the game, but sorry, I've got, I'm in the suite. I know. It's okay, because <laughs> when you come to the tailgate, everyone will hide their beers. So don't worry. <laughs> I'll be reaching for one. All right. <laughs> hey, good talking. Have a good yep. weekend. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Right. Talk soon.